Welcome back to Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous. In the last episode, we finished Leper's Smile, which is good, and we got the parts we needed for uh, our progression into the uh, Lich uh, Department later on. Now, we still have some movement left on our Crusader army, so I think we're going to go and uh, head on over and take these uh, fortresses here. And uh, the other army can uh, push up this direction. I believe it is out of movement. Yes, it is. Uh, but we also have our own party that we also need to move around a bit, so we need to go to Heaven's Edge. But before we do any of that, let's just get this stuff over with. Ghouls, skeletons, sharpshooters. Those need to go. Some of the sound effects are quite amusing. We got a level from that. Uh, protective wards. Yes, protective wards. Uh, that fortress, I think we have to go down and then up again. Now our crusader camp is here instead of here, because every time we take a fortress closer to Dresden, the camp moves. Sharpshooter there, sharpshooter there. And you can go away. You can go away, I said. Eventually, I'm going to need more than 500 of each of the troop in, in the army. There is one particularly nasty uh, army down south here. Soldiers came across a group of riders on fatigued horses. They were desperately fending off a demon attack after what had clearly been a long pursuit. The crusaders slew the fiends and questioned the travelers. The riders turned out to be escaped prisoners from the demon's mines outside Dresden. They had killed their cultist guard and stolen the horses. According to them, their guards knew nothing of the commander's forces, so hopefully his offensive will catch Dresden unawares. Get some more. Okay, I think we might have to actually move our main army. Yeah, these armies, I'm not sure what to do with them, to be honest. We do need three, four, five armies eventually, but... These are melee attackers. Yeah, scimitars. But they are scouts, so these, these are both mounted. And we are, of course, stuck at Leper's Smile. Let's head on to, uh, to Heaven's Edge. We might need to rest, but... We do have Darren, Darren in the party, so... We will not enter, we will camp, and now I have to do all this again. Camouflage, uh, you, Wuldrif, Lan, you can do the Night Watch. Uh, we want Thunfix to be doing that one, and... I don't think we want Caledon to be doing the Night Watch. Uh, Lan and Sila is better. Uh, we could definitely use a little bit of additional on that one. This one is not necessary, uh, but we could use Darren here. I think these two are added together, but I'm not entirely sure. That said, I've never actually been attacked at night. I don't understand you paladins. Well, really, it's that I don't understand the huge clanking suits of armor you wear. Watch out! Here comes Sir Clanks a lot, everybody! So what? This way everybody knows that good is on its way to beat down evil. Yeah, I'm with Lan on this one.
Okay, let's enter Heaven's Edge. My not so numerous, but nonetheless dearest guests. About a year ago at my last birthday party, I assured you all that I nurtured a deep-seated hatred for boring people who give protracted speeches in the misplaced belief that their inner thoughts are of any interest to anyone but themselves. Now I am a whole year older and also a full-fledged crusader, an honorable position that requires me to be as dull, pedantic, and vexing as I possibly can. Therefore, a speech it is. The revered cleric Nestrin, my guardian and tutor, often told me that those who live a sinful life may expect to join the abyssal hordes after they die. This is why their path is the most despicable of all. A part of their soul may return to Mendev in the abominable form of a demonic invader. Every time we see a demon, we might as well think about it. What if this wretched creature used to be your great-great-grandfather? What if certain parts of this pointy-tailed beauty used to belong to your pious cousin? They say that the demons represent the sins of the souls they are made of. Succubi emerge out of lustful souls. Vandals turn into Abracandilu. Gluttons become Nabasu. I, for one, am determined to commit as many different sins as possible so that the distributive mechanism of the abyss breaks when it tries to decide what to do with my soul. He's, um, he might be onto something there. You, my dearest guests, will be my assistants in this complicated task. Eat, drink, and indulge yourselves in whatever vices you can. Let nobody leave this house as righteous as they entered it. Live every day like it's your last. After all, nobody knows when that day will arrive, do they? How interesting. Inquisitor Leotor whispers in your ear from behind. You find anything interesting? Nothing, really. I just took note of a few things. I attempted to find out whether anything unusual or mysterious has happened to the Count over the last ten years. During my conversations with his acquaintances, two people noted that he never speaks of the revered Nestrin, the priest of Iomedae who was his guardian and tutor. Yet he just mentioned Nestrin in his speech, whatever that might mean. You told me that you tried to find out if anything odd had happened to Darren over the last ten years. Some of his servants complained about strange occurrences in the house, like objects moving by themselves or candles going out. Of course, that could simply be a figment of their imagination. It, all, it is also very well known that the Count often invites various spellcasters to entertain him and encourages them to use their magic in mischievous ways. Practically the whole Mendem knows the story about the three drunk wizards and their, their teleportation race across the roofs of Canabras after a party at the Count's house. What I'm trying to say here is that any fluctuations in residual magic at his house are not at all surprising. There was the matter of the abduction, however. A gang of bandits kidnapped the Count, hoping for a ransom, but the only reward they got was death. Afterward, the Count told everyone that he had hired the bandits himself as a joke. The other mercenary squad that freed him and executed the bandits was also in his employ. Nobody really wanted to delve too deep into this case after confirming the identities of those wretched cutthroats, but there was one disturbing fact about it all, and I don't mean the Count's bizarre idea of fun. The mercenaries who supposedly freed him had also cut off the bandits' heads, after they had already killed them. Their heads were cut off? You mean the bandits who attacked Darren? Yes. Perhaps I wouldn't have even noticed this detail had I not visited Heaven's Edge right after the tragic incident. 
I remember that we also found several headless bodies, both of guests and demons. We thought they had been decapitated during the fight. What do we need a doing, visitor? Now that now that's the hardest part. I need to dive deep into the past of this place, which requires casting several different spells over some time. It would be very convenient for me if nobody interrupted the process, especially the Count himself. I don't think he remembers my face, but a suspicious stranger casting unknown spells? That might attract his attention. All in all, what I want you to do is to distract the master of the house. Right now, he is playing host in the very place I'd like to start with. So, how do I distract him? I don't know. Maybe uh, one of uh, your companions can assist you somehow, or you can take a look around. Perhaps there's something that can help us. I understand. Good luck, and come back to me when the Count leaves. I will tell you everything I managed to find out, and maybe even show you something. Decorative plants are in a miserable state. They have been neglected for many years. Before we do anything... Oh, we could have... We can use the wine to distract the Count. But before we do anything, I'd like to, uh, you know, have a look around. There might be... Um, there might be items that Caledon's cleaning service has to uh, to deal with. I know the way. This door is sealed and looks like it hasn't been opened in a very long time. That one too. This one goes out. Can't get down there. I don't think I have enough knowledge world to be able to... Uh... No, I would need a, a 19 or a 20. Iron Masterwork Orc Double Axe. Regular Heavy Shield. Another one of those sealed doors. Very, very pretty bedroom. Countess Selena Nevia Dara Arende with her infant son Darren. Unlike typical aristocratic portraits, this one depicts a young mother having fun with her child on a seesaw. Follow my lead. Clear purpose. Ooh, that one is nice. Two books. Another book. What does that? What a find! Hmm. It seems there is a hidden cache inside the wall. You can see a keyhole among the decoration. Well, I need a key. Huh. It's a rather nice painting at that. As it should be. Where would we find a key? I don't have the highest perception. That is not far. Um, okay. Seems that the option we have is 
using the wine. I wonder if I click that knowledge world thing, does it use mine? It does not use mine. There are occasional traces of older masonry and foundations. It looks like the building was reconstructed several times. I was generous of the game. I'll go ahead. And suddenly all the animal, animal companions are here, okay. I know the way. Okay, my dear Count. Darren, who has been watching the guests with an unreadable expression, turn it, turns his head to you and says in a casual tone, like he's continuing a conversation that was interrupted. I have always considered myself an esti esteth. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not. I guess esteth, since it's aesthetical. Aesteth, esteth, something like that. Sorry. I've always considered myself a, that word, not a hero. When doomsday comes, I thought I'd pour myself a glass of hundred-year-old wine, sit in the front row and just watch the world burn. Playing the violin was also an option. Now, I'll be damned if I know how I ended up in the Fifth Crusade. How did I become the companion of a hero chosen by Iomede? It was our destiny to end up together. Darren snorts and averts his eyes for a moment. Oh, do go on. Tell me more about Heaven's Edge. This estate was once a truly beautiful sight with its lush gardens and placid ponds. Darren smiles briefly. It is a genuine smile, quite different from his usual half smirk. The house itself is not that large, however. This land was part of the border region, even before the world wound, so my ancestors took that into account when laying the foundations. The larger the mansion, the harder it is to defend. I'd gladly give you a tour, but I'm afraid there's not much to see here. I didn't have much time, so my servants only managed to clean up this yard, the great hall, and a couple of rooms. There is nothing interesting about them, except perhaps the magical firefighting system powered by water elementals. I'm not sure it's still functional, though. Seize your chance to have fun. Almost anything can be forgiven but boredom. That is a crime against life itself. What did it say? We can activate the fire suppression system? How the heck do we do that? That sounds fun. Certainly can't be over here. Follow my lead. I wonder if this was the, um... Count's bedroom? I have no idea how to, uh, enable... And there should be something that I could interact with to engage that fire suppression system. As it should be. One moment, please. Apparently it's something that I activate. Oh, I didn't mean to move that window there. Apparently it's something that I activate I activate in the courtyard. <laughs> Set the booze on fire, okay. Oops. Stupid elemental, go back to where you came from. I am the owner of this estate and you will obey me. Oh well, now I'm soaked to the bone. Give me a moment to change my clothes and don't forget to miss me while I'm gone. That's an effective fire suppression system.
I see that you did your part, Commander. Thank you. Now get ready to watch and listen closely. I will unravel the past of this place and try to show you whatever I find. The hum of voices, laughter and music fills your mind. Then the visions come, fragmented and hazy at first, before eventually coalescing to reveal a single face. It is a woman of stunning heavenly beauty, and her delicate features instantly tell you who she is. The family resemblance to Darren is obvious. My dear guests, the Lady of Heaven's Edge welcomes all of you today. I hope this day is as bright for you as it is for me, because on this day my only precious, sometimes arrogant, but utterly beloved child was born. A child is usually a reflection of their parents and caretakers. Countess, will you allow the humble tutor of this young man to address the guests and the man of Ami Hour as well? A new face appears. It is a handsome old man with a strong, dignified posture and a voice that emanates power. Can't we have just one day without your sermons? It is my birthday, after all. Ten years ago, the young Darren had an utterly angelic appearance. His table manners and expression lack the dignity of a true angel, however. Day, I'm sure the revered Nestrin only wanted to hug you and offer you his best wishes on your birthday. Wait, what? what is that noise? The shrill laughter rings in your ears and reverberates in the base of your skull. In the vision, a Lilitu appears before the guests of the estate and gives them an exaggerated, scornful bow. The sorcerers of evil have come to your celebration, mortals. Did you prepare a treat for me too? What do you want, spawn of the abyss? I've already done everything I wanted to. Hey! You, doddering cleric, look around. Don't you notice anything odd? The plague is in your wine, in your food, in the air around you, in your blood. Soon you will all die. Pray to your pathetic goddess and call upon your healing powers all you want, but they're not going to help you. Nothing will help you. I will give you a chance to see it for yourselves, and when I return, the grave realization will have all sunk its teeth into your throats. Oh, how I love watching mortals in their final desperate hours. The demon finishes her speech with an air kiss to Darren, making him freeze in horror and disappears. Leotr shakes his head and slowly exhales, rubbing his temple. The first appearance of the disease and the Lilitu, one of the many sisters of the accursed Minago. So far, everything I've seen matches the official version of events. Who were the people in this vision? Countess Selena Arande was Darren's mother and one of the most beautiful women in the history of Mendev. She was an Azimar, just like her son. The old man is the esteemed cleric Nestrin, our Count's guardian and tutor. He was well known for his unfaltering faith and iron will. I was only passing acquaintances with him, so I can't tell you anything more than that. I didn't recognize the others, but Darren told me that the first victims of the disease were his second cousin and the cousin's wife, hailing from the eastern border. Surely the cleric could have done something. I can't say for certain, but I believe there was nothing he could have done. Magical diseases are already difficult enough to cure, and this plague struck very fast indeed. Now, we must find out what happened next. What now? I can sense the aftershocks of very strong outbursts of, outburst of emotions and memories somewhere in the west wing of the house. Something must have happened in one of the rooms, so please check if anyone is in there and distract them if need be. Right shall do so. What are you doing here, Wolf? I just saw a portrait of Darren's mum. 
So, she was an RCMR too, huh? Some people get a celestial bloodline, tons of money and a title, while other others get horns and a slap in the face. Well, nobody said life was fair, young Wildriff. Darren arches a brow at you, but he doesn't seem to be disturbed in the slightest by your entrance. He's not trying to cover up or get dressed any faster. Commander, I assume that you have an urgent matter that requires my attention. What is this room? Darren casts a look around the room as if he had never seen it before, then shrugs carelessly. Just a random room. I told my servants to make some rooms ready. This is one of the rooms they chose. I'm absolutely confident that you won't be able... Ooh. Oh no. I'm absolutely confident that you won't be able to persuade Sociel to do a portrait of you. A nude portrait, that is. That sounds like a fine idea. Our cleric will surely turn down a direct request, but... If I tell him that we can sell the portrait at a charity auction... Why have I never thought... Well, why have I never before thought of selling my nude portraits at a charity auction? It will cause a huge scandal, but it will also be for a good cause. This will give those god-botherers something to complain about. You've given me a brilliant idea! Okay. I, I, I love Darren. I see that you were able to do as I asked. Prepare yourself. This vision might be rather difficult to watch. Young Darren stands motionless by the Countess's bed. His face is pale with fear, and for good reason. His mother's heavenly beauty is gone. Her smile, once beaming with vitality and happiness, looks more like the grimace of a corpse. Only her golden hair still glows, a sad reminder of the healthy young woman she was just a few hours ago. Mother! Can you hear me, mother? Day, my boy. How did you get here? The Countess's voice is fading. Don't come any closer. I... Uh, this disease... Mother, listen. The revered Nestrin has sealed all the gates. He says that he won't let anyone leave the estate. If the plague reaches the larger settlements, nobody will be able to stop it. He claims this is why the demons attacked us in the first place. They knew that we could call upon the strongest clerics to heal us, and those clerics would catch the disease and die as well. The fat baron and his family tried to escape, but three armed paladins barred their way and said they would not let them go. Mother, we need help. Canabras is full of clerics, wizards, and demons know who else. They might know how to stop it. We need to get there as soon as possible. We must obey the revered Nestrin. We are the lords of Mendev, and we must protect our people. The plague... If it reaches Canabras, thousands of innocent people will die. I don't care about innocents. Darren's voice rises to a shout. You're ill, mother. You... you... you're dying. You must tell them to open the gates and take her to Canabras. They won't listen to me, but you are the lady of the estate. They can't refuse you. I... I can't. I... I... I must... Please leave, my dearest. Don't lose hope. You can still... A convulsion overtakes the Countess's body. Her last words are swallowed by a long, guttural groan. Lyotr warily rubs his temples, but his face is unreadable. Now I have an answer to one of my many questions. Nobody went to Canabras in search of help because the revered Nestrin didn't let them. He valued the safety of the city more than the lives of his flock at the estate. What a difficult choice it must have been. Was there really no other choice? Who can say now? They could have sent one of the paladins to bring help from Canabras, assuming that the Knight of God was immune to the disease. 
Perhaps Nestrin thought he might need them to maintain order. Or maybe he understood that the demons would not allow anyone to leave anyway. Or maybe the plague was so strong that it could mow, mow down even the most righteous warriors. We will never know if any of these hypotheses are true. Leotra rubs his chin thoughtfully. I have never been in the revered Nestrin's position, but I know the price of difficult decisions, especially those that you have to make quickly. I have no right to judge him, but we must continue our investigation. The next site I'd like to examine is the Great Hall. That is where we found the remains of Nestrin and the demons. I assume that he killed them in a confrontation, but we must make sure of that. Please help me clear the area so that I can study it. Working with Inquisitors. That is not far. Stop trying to talk me into this. You have neither heart nor conscience, Darren. Even the noble idea of charity becomes a farce when you touch it. I don't think these so-called innocents will suffer from knowing that their money and medicine came from my sinful silhouette. He did try, though. But it seems Socio wasn't enamored with the idea. I'll go ahead. There is a feverish gleam to Darren's eyes, owing either to tipsiness or some overabundance of emotion. Oh there, Caledorn. That rotter Social refused to sketch me in the nude for charity, but he didn't upset me too much. The faces he made while I was explaining the idea to him were well worth it. He looked very, very much like a pious matron being confronted with a talking male organ. One that was two foot long and being held aloft by a pair of golden angel wings. How are you enjoying my party? Are you having a good time? How about you, Darren? Are you having any fun? Of course I'm having fun, Darren says defiantly. What's wrong? You want me to spend my whole life in fear and mourning, blaming myself for what happened? Fine, let's change the subject. I thought the unique ambience of Heaven's Edge and the fact that we are on the very border of the World Wound would make this celebration special. I thought the past would resurface and make itself known. Darren smirks bitterly. Well, it seems even ghosts don't wish to attend my parties anymore. What can we do to live up the evening? Um, you know what I think? I think it's time for a drinking contest. Ah yes, the tried and trusted method for salvaging a dull party. For salvaging anything, actually. I am ready, but who's my competition? Sila will fight for the honor of all paladins. Yes, sir, commander. Darren, my boy, you still got time to back out. You don't want you don't want Auntie Sila to spank you in front of everyone now, do you? Oh dear. What do you do if I win? Are you going to cry and pray to Iomade for an alcohol resistance aura? Now that would be something worth seeing. Let's drink until one of us falls unconscious or begs for mercy. The Paladin and the Oracle in a drinking competition. That was just a little warm up I say. Up for more? The fear of your in inevitable defeat has already gotten the better of you, Darren. I can see it in your eyes, boy. Come on, let's have another round. Will this be the one that knocks you flat? Failing in battle against such a worthy opponent won't even bruise my ego. Especially if you carry me upstairs to bed afterward. Um, I'm cheering for Darren. Go on, Count. Show us what you've got. That was unexpected. I thought everyone was against me. Whoa. Are we done here? Or are you ready for another round? 
To whom should I delicate this glorious feat, putting the haughty, self-absorbed prick of a count in his place? To my dearest royal cousin. I am sure any failure of mine will bring her joy. Oh, my head feels funny. My grandfather, or maybe my great-grandmother, put this bottle in the family cellar? So why did it fail the scion of the illustrious Arendays in his time of need? Darren looks a bit unsteady on his feet. I don't feel very well. Hey, everyone, let's go back outside. I <coughs> need some fresh air in my lungs. Here we are again, Commander. The altar looks grim but focused. So, let us take another glimpse into the past. A ripple of laughter flows through the hall. It begins as a sweet, charming chuckle, but then turns into a rasping cackle that makes Darren huddle even deeper into the corner. Why are you running from me, my sweet prince? Come on, let me touch you. I'll give you... The booming voice of an old man dressed in Iomedean robes shakes the walls of the hall. Get away from him, demon. Let the boy go. By the blade of the inheritor, you must you touch him over my dead body. Key you a pathetic old cleric. Are you the guardian of this charming little prince? Well, you guarded him in vain. The disease is already circulating in his blood, and soon he will rot before your very eyes. You won't be able to help him, and I... I can at least make sure his death is beautiful, clean, and sweet. The demoness turns her eyeless face to Darren and licks her lips. A coarse laugh escapes the young man's throat. We'll see about that. Leotra turns toward you in astonishment. Droplets of sweat glisten on his temple. Something is wrong, Commander. My spells are not working as expected. It is as if some kind of a supernatural explosion occurred here ten years ago, blending everything together. The magical auras, the emotions, the memories. I will try again to read it. Please continue. Just give me a moment to focus. I will try to channel my visions and feelings to you as accurately as possible. Darren, my boy, what is going on? The otter's muscular shoulders suddenly begin to shake. The vision he is channeling does not change, but you feel something enormous and Chillingly, si chilling silently infiltrate the reality around you. The presence of this nameless being becomes almost palpable. Some alien entity is talking to him. Hurry up, old cleric. Stop him right now. Do you really want to see what happens when... Save me. Can you save me? The presence thickens into something more tangible. The entity is silent, but you feel your blood pulsing in your temples, and each beat brings a new image, or rather, a new notion. Help brings a feeling of relief and safety. Exchange makes the pulse stronger, more demanding. Gate and secret come immediately after. The images become heavier, almost visible. Secret. Keep the secret. Otherwise, death. 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 The gruesome images whirl through your mind, filling it with pain and fear, and then it starts all again. Help, exchange, secret, death. Nestrin stretches out his shaking hand, suddenly looking like a doddering old man instead of a mighty cleric imbued with holy power. Darren, wait, the thing you're about to let loose is even worse than these demons. Darren's body is quivering like a taut bowstring. bowstring his eyes dart from the cleric to the demoness, who is frantically casting protective spells. Demons. Saints. I am so fed up with all of you. Burn. 
Lyotr opens his eyes with a groan, then gets back on his feet. His legs are wobbly, his eyebrow is cut, but he seems not to notice. A sincere sorrow is written on his face, as well as a strong hint of horror. What a misfortune. No, what a disaster. Everything is far worse than I imagined. Are you alright? The strain, the, the emotions, they, they overwhelmed me and made me faint like an agitated youngster. It is nothing, really. I will not be able to cast any spells for the rest of the day, but aside from that, I'm I'm fine. Do you understand now what happened ten years ago? The Inquisitor slowly exhales through clenched teeth and says in a low voice, still massaging his temples. Yes and no. Damn it, my, my thoughts are astray. I will try to explain everything to you in full detail. Many living things are capable of performing the most extraordinary feats, good or bad, when a deadly threat looms over them. Ten years ago, the young Count found himself cornered in every sense of the word, and he allowed some alien entity to intercede for him. It frightens me that all my experience as an Inquisitor is completely useless in this case. It does not resemble anything I have ever heard or read about. This entity, I, I think I will call it the Other, possesses uncanny power. It was capable of instantly killing three greater demons, a mighty cleric, and a host of other mortals. You saw everything yourself. But what's even worse is that this entity, this Other, it is still here. Leotro takes a long pause. His gaze is drawn to the chamber where all the guests are laughing and dancing. Darren's eloquent voice rises above the music for a moment. He's asking someone to bring more wine and add more logs to the fire. I don't know exactly what this creature is, but I do know what it did to the Count. It turned him into a living gateway. The other is not inside the Count's body. It is not directly controlling his mind. That is why there is no obvious signs of possession. But it is looking through his eyes. It treats him like a window into our world and it can instantly step through to wreak whatever havoc it desires. Does Darren know anything about all this? Yes, of course he does. Did you hear what the other tried to uh, convey to us? Help in exchange for a secret. Death. Death to the, those who know the truth. It wants to have an opportunity to use the Count as a gateway without anyone knowing. This is what made Darren deny that he remembered anything about the conclusion of the events at Heaven's Edge. What might the other want? This is the strangest thing about it all. It came to this world ten years ago and it's still here, right? All this time it has been watching us through the eyes of the Count. Had it, for instance, wanted to kill Her Majesty the Queen, it would have had plenty of opportunities to do so. The Count can get close to practically every influential figure in Mendev, but the other refuses to act, or its interests lie in some other sphere. Did the other kill everyone then? The disease was not to blame? Not everyone, just Nestrin, his paladins, and the few remaining guests. Damn it, I know that it was the work of a mysterious omnipotent entity, but it still stings. I was here ten years ago, and I didn't check everything personally. And those who did failed to sense that something was wrong. We have to do something. Yes. Now I understand Father Nestrin perfectly. I must make a crucial decision, despite a dearth of information. The Inquisitor falls silent for a while, then he looks you right into the eye. Commander, first and foremost, I must apologize to you. Second, I must ask you to keep this secret. What are you so sorry for? I apologize for dragging you into this mess. You see, 
At the other, an entity of immense power stated very clearly that it would kill anyone who found out the truth. Anyone who knows that the Count is actually its living gateway. I suppose this secret is currently known to three people on Galarian. You, me, and Count Darren. And that means... Leotro gives you a crooked smirk and shrugs. Why should I keep it a secret? As soon as the Count finds out what, that we know his secret, the other will understand it as well. We do not know what it is and a, what exactly is the scope of its powers, but we do know that it would dispose of anyone who might reveal its existence. I've made a decision, Leotra says gravely. I will not tell anyone about the discovery we have just made, not even the Queen or my superiors. Instead, I will immediately go to Nerosian and sift through all the archives of the Inquisition in order to find out what exactly we are dealing with and how it can possibly be defeated. I may also make some cautious inquiries in other places, including Absalom. Still, I will not reveal the truth until I have found at least some reliable information. I am asking you to do the same. Specifically, do not say a single word about our investigation to the Count himself. So you want to, me to lead the crusade while carrying a bomb that may explode at any moment? I'm afraid that you won't be able to hide from the consequences when this bomb does explode. It is up to you to decide, though. What are you going to do with Darren himself? At the very least, he is guilty of letting the other enter our world. Right now, I am a lot more concerned about the other, but when we find a way to get rid of this entity, the Count will have to stand trial. Many things about this case are still unclear, including the extent of his guilt. Did he call upon the other by himself, or did he simply answer its call? Could he refuse its offer, or would it have, would it have led to his immediate death? Every detail is important, and every testimony needs solid proof. That is, the right, that is the difference between righteous justice and blind vengeance. I cannot promise you anything. I actually know lawful. Fine, I will keep it a secret. <sighs> You've made the right choice. I recommend that you go back to the guests and spend the rest of the evening as you please. Anything else might raise suspicions. I must leave immediately in search of the knowledge we all need so desperately. Farewell, Commander. May the light of Iomede guide your path, and Leotr Hawkblade will try to keep your path to triumph clear of any unwanted guests. I know the way. One moment, please. There we go. Need to check something in regards to that keyhole thing that we found. Which we cannot do anything with now, so uh, that saves me the time that I would have been spending walking around here, looking for it. No, if my opinion matters to you at all, but you were the very best guest I could ever wish for. Okay, are we done here? Apparently so. Follow my lead. Well, we apparently are done here, so on that note, I also think that we are about done with the episode. If you do have any questions and or comments, as per usual, please do feel free to leave those in the comment section. Darren's story is definitely interesting. But for now, thank you all so much for joining me. And I hope to be seeing you all in the next episode.